Great. Okay, thanks. Okay, good morning, uh, everyone, and thanks for joining uh, Grand Rounds. The Lurie Cancer Center is uh, honored, excited to be hosting uh, this week's Big Ten Cancer Research Consortium Grand Rounds. Uh, today's speaker is Adam Lynn. Adam is an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Clinically, his clinical interest is focused on lymphoma, cellular therapy, and uh, stem cell transplantation. Uh, Adam has uh, developed, in the process of developing, you'll hear about this this morning, a new construct, the nanotechnology and biomaterials lab for blood cancers, which is uh, really a, a, an attempt to bridge the gap between material science and technological advancements and, uh, and clinical trials uh, to provide new treatments. Uh, Adam uh, had his uh, MD at Baylor College of Medicine, PhD from Rice University in material sciences. He did his residency and fellowship in our PSDP program at Northwestern University. The topic today is expanding the lymphoma therapy toolkit, bioengineering and HDL mimetic platform, and a photothermal immune activation method. So I think you're gonna be excited to hear some of this stuff. Questions uh, can be put in the chat and we'll try and get to them at the end of the talk. Um, Adam? Thanks, Leo. Let me uh, get my slides up here. Okay. Thanks, Leo, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in. I'm delighted to be here today to share some of the early progress of our lab and its potential impact on lymphoma therapy. So here are the objectives of the talk. You know, we'll review some types of nanotechnology and cancer therapy and just kind of discuss two uh, major platforms that we're working on, the photothermal ablation device for T-cell enhancement, as well as the biomimetic cholesterol depleting nanoparticle that is an HDL mimetic to treat cholesterol addicted cancers. So like Leo said, I have a background in nanotechnology design and biomaterials fabrication. Clinically, I am focused on lymphoma patients, and I also attend on the stem cell transplant and cell therapy service. About a year and a half ago, when I joined faculty here, my vision was to build a program to bridge the divide between technology advancements and practical clinical applications. So we shifted our focus from developing new nanoparticle designs, which several wonderful labs do, to really utilizing existing technologies in innovative ways to address a, a clinical, uh, critical unmet needs for patients with hematologic malignancies. So our slogan really is to find the right technology for the right patient. The most common question I get is how small are nanoparticles? Um, if an average adult human is the size of a lymphoma cell or a cancer cell, nanoparticles are actually the size of M&Ms. So a lymphoma cell can actually take up to tens of thousands of nanoparticles, giving it a lot of variety of options for therapeutic uh, targets. So here are four of the oldest approved nanoparticle cancer, uh, nanoparticles in cancer therapy. Of course, you've already heard about Braxane, Doxel, and uh, liposomal or beno uh, These three drugs have been around the market for a while. They're still doing several trials on these, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, newly joining this group in just the last couple of years for AML, as we were talking about AML before this, uh, is Vixios, or liposomal, essentially 7 plus 3, for AML. But these are what we call first-generation nanoparticle designs. They're very, ele very elementary and simple, encapsulating drugs or encapsulating, uh, using the albumin to encapsulate paclitaxel, stuff like that. Uh, even the COVID vaccine is made with liposome carrying mRNA. So this technology is not necessarily new, even though we thought it was very new at the time when the mRNA vaccines came out. 
but it, it was just really waiting for the right application. There are many, many, many new and exciting, exciting nanotechnology designs that are developed by super smart chemists and bioengineers, but only a few of them are in clinical trials right now. So this slide shows the overview of the platforms that we are developing to impact various uh, MET needs. We focus on two things. One is, like I said before, finding the right technology. And two is to find ways to expedite translation to the clinic. Due to the nature of our research program, we have a strong emphasis on teamwork and collaborations. Our collaborators are in several departments, including urology, radiology, immunology, neurosurgery, chemistry, as well as other institutions, such as City of Hope, University of Illinois, Chicago, and Cornell. Of course, we interact and partner with several startup companies. In this talk today, we will go over two of the main platforms as it is closest to clinical trials. So these two on the left. It is important to note that in order to do what we want to do, we need the right resources. Northwestern is unique in a way that it is a thought leader in nanotechnology. In addition to being an NCI appointed comprehensive cancer center, we were also an NCI designated center of cancer nanotechnology excellence or the CCNE program for all three funding cycles. Northwestern also houses the International Institute for Nanotechnology led by Chad Merkin, as well as the Center for Nano-Oncology. These foundations provide a great opportunity for us to push these technologies I'm gonna describe later in this talk into the clinic to benefit our patients. Well, the first platform that I wanna talk about today is the photothermal immune activation method. Due to time constraints, I will highlight the key findings and insights that we have discovered through this process. However, I'm more than happy to engage in further discussions and delve into details. If you contact me personally, we can set up the time to talk. Everything starts with a patient. When I was a fellow in Dr. Gordon's clinic, we had a patient who was actually on this, this specific trial. This trial enrolled patients with untreated advanced indolent lymphomas and treated it with local low dose radiation, which is two grays times two, we call it boom boom radiation, and included a TLR9 agonist, SD101, which is a CPG sequence. Evaluation of the response was done both at the treated site, but also the untreated, the non-treated sites. The waterfall plots here look pretty good. Most of the patient have some sort of response, but the overall response rate was only 27.5%. Our patients had some response, but progressed soon after. So the question I wondered is, can we improve on this strategy? Can we generate a more durable and deeper systemic immune response? What technologies can we use? We then looked into a technology called photothermal therapy or PTT. I was personally very familiar with PTT as I worked on this technology in its early phases during my graduate career. The premise of PTT is pretty straightforward. Uh, we exploit the absorbance property of metallic nanoparticles by designing them to absorb light. Uh, some, some of you might not know this, but metallic nanoparticles were actually used to stain glass windows in cathedrals and what makes it different kind of colors like blue or red is because they use different sizes and different types of metallic nanoparticles to get that color. So optical properties of metallic nanoparticles has been around for a long time and here we're just kind of uh, using that property for a purpose of uh, this photothermal therapy. Specifically, we design these particles in different ways to absorb light in the near infrared region. We do that because that is where the water window is. A water window is where light is absorbed the least uh, in, uh, when it's irradiated to water and hemoglobin. The energy absorbed from the light 
uh, on the nanoparticle then becomes heat. Uh, the heat leads to a burn response. The temperature right next to the nanoparticle actually gets extremely hot and dissipates quickly further away from the particle, allowing for very tight spatial control of where we want this photothermal therapy or the burn to be. The burn actually causes immunogenic cell death, releasing things called damps, which then makes a cold tumor hot. PTT has been studied in several, several, several solid tumor models, including breast cancer, colon cancer, and melanoma, but little is known about how PTT works in lymphoma specifically. So to study photothermal therapy in lymphoma, we collaborated with Dr. Kim in radiology, who is an expert in photothermal applications, and he has many very impressive des nanoparticle designs focused on several GI malignancies. They have a special type of gold nanoparticle, in this case called branched gold nanoparticles, and we chose this because in between these branches, we're able to stuff these TLR9 agonists as the SD1 is one you see before, which is the CPG sequences into the nanoparticle itself. Despite this odd looking shape, these particles actually retain the light absorption in the near infrared region. And you can successfully, it can successfully be used to ablate lymphoma tumors as you see here on the mouse. But we wanted to mimic the clinical trial. So to mimic the radiation CPG clinical trial, as I mentioned before, we used a tool, dual lymphoma tumor model where we implanted a, 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 a primary tumor on the left and a secondary lymphoma tumor on the right flank. We found that radiation of the left tumor, the primary tumor, um, and photothermal therapy both can uh, eliminate, or were both were effective in reducing the tumor on the treated side. But what was super interesting was photothermal therapy was better at suppressing growth in the untreated side. So therefore having a stronger systemic anti-lymphoma response. But the question was why, why is this the case? What cell type is leading this change? So we delve into it deeper and here's kind of a summary of what we found. We found that the improved systemic tumor suppression is essentially due to an improved T cell profile or landscape. The tumors, both primary and secondary, um, had higher CD8 and CTLs, which interfere in gamma secreting CD8s, and lower CD4s and Tregs. The draining lymph nodes in the treated and untreated sides both had increased digitic cell maturation telling us there's education going on after the photothermal therapy. In the spleen, which we sometimes correlate to what we find in the blood, we found a higher level of CD8 T cell levels and lower Tregs, again, like we've seen in the primary and secondary tumor. Interestingly, there was a significant increase in effector memory T cells. Memory T cells are linked to improved immunotherapies like six such as checkpoint inhibitors, but also cellular therapy efficacies. These results provided the foundation that photothermal therapy can be used to treat lymphoma and maybe even better than radiation for creating a systemic anti-lymphoma immune response. Though exciting, our goal is to figure out how to bring this concept to the clinic. So during the time after I graduated PhD and I was doing my medical training, which is quite some time, a startup company came out of Rice University called Nanospectra. Nanospectra was founded out of the lab that was next to mine to bring photothermal therapy to the clinic. So this is how I, I knew this, that group of people. They used these, a different type of nanoparticle called silica gold nanoshells that looks like this with the silica on the inside and gold on the outside. These particles are about 50 times smaller than a red blood cell. So this is an actual two scale what a red blood cell to a nanoparticle will look like. Again, showing how small these nanoparticles actually are. In their clinical trial, they infuse nanoshells intravenously. The particles will collect at tumor sites due to the EPR effect or the enhanced permeability and retention effect as they leak, to the leak through the vasculature. Then they insert their optic uh, fiber cable into the prostate or the, where the, wherever the tumor is via image guidance. They then turn on the laser, 
which then activates only the nanoparticles. Their focus was really getting rid of tumors at the time. Uh, so kind of looking at it in an immunological sense, they were very interested in partnering with us to conduct trials with this system, the oral system, specifically for lymphoma. The major problem that we run into in terms of commercialization is that these nanoparticles that they use, these silica nano, nanoshells, are uh, under their IDE to be inert, or else they would be considered a drug and then would have to go through a formal I and D process. So because of that, we will not be able to modify this nanoparticle at all. If we want to continue using the branch nanoparticles with the CPGs, we would have to have, create a separate startup company to make these particles, go through regulations um, and a formal IND and toxicity studies. So in order to kind of see how this actually works, we decided to pivot and try to be creative using their oral system. But if we're not gonna use these CPGs, what are we gonna combine photothermal therapy with? We know that photothermal therapy alone or PTT alone is not good enough and an immune stimulant is needed. Actually, over the 15 years of PTT research, there has been a tremendous amount of preclinical data in solid tumors. Again, the breast, colon, and melanoma being the most common ones. Looking at combining PTT with checkpoint inhibitors, showing actually quite an impressive efficacy in preclinical models. So for practical purposes, we decided to pivot to checkpoint inhibitors instead. First, of course, we had to prove to ourselves that the orally system combined with a checkpoint inhibitor actually works on lymphoma. So we used the same lymphoma model as we discussed before and found that one treatment that you see here in the red of PTT combined with three doses, just three doses of anti-PD-1 therapy already caused a significant tumor growth reduction. Currently, we're in the process of sorting out the details of a phase one study using PTT with anti pd one therapy in relapsed refractory non functional lymphoma patients. For this first trial, we'll focus on patients that include cutaneous lesions. And I'm sure people are wondering why that's the case. So why focus on cutaneous lesions? Well, for this first trial, these patients can have cystic can have systemic neural disease, but we just require them to have cutaneous lesions. This very obscure patient population, of course, is not our ultimate goal, but we chose to focus on cutaneous lesions for two reasons. One, we have a spin-off platform called Nanoflame, which we'll discuss in a couple of slides. Nanoflame utilizes cutaneous PTT ablations, so lessons we learned from this trial, we can use to develop that new technology. Two, we want to learn more about PTT and how it works in lymphoma patients. And this is by far the easiest way to do it. Treating nodal disease is what we want, but it's a bit more complicated, will require IR and sedation, and of course, additional costs. So this will be our next phase of trials, PTTing diseased lymph nodes in lymphoma patients combined with cellular therapies. Can PTT actually improve cellular therapies? Well, what cellular therapies, what cellular therapies are we thinking about? Of course, the simple one is the new, new, new kid on the block, the bispecific antibodies. Bispecific antibodies are full antibodies that bind to two targets. In lymphoma therapy, that is typically CD20 and CD3 grabbing a T cell. Um, there are two FDA-approved by specifics for lymphomas, as you see in the table here, not noted by the stars. Um, you got mozentuzumab approved for follicular lymphoma, aportamab, which actually just got approved a couple of weeks ago, um, is approved for aggressive lymphomas. When you look at the uh, CR rate for especially the aggressive lymphomas, there is definitely room for improvement. On the other hand, CD19 targeting CAR T cell therapy has uh, revolutionized how we treat lymphoma. It has moved up to the second line treatment algorithm, especially for aggressive lymphomas after being approved for third line therapy just a couple of years ago. Overall, almost 60% of patients still relapse. The ZUMA1 study 
just reported a longer follow-up showing a five-year overall survival of 42%. So again, there is definitely some room for improvement. What have we learned from these types of immunotherapies is that one, CRs tend to lead to a tail effect with some patients who achieve CR that are potentially cured. Getting more patients to put more patients into CR will be the goal. Two, what is the limiting what is limiting the efficacies of these cell therapies? Well, that is a pretty complicated question, and there's several several people looking at very various uh, aspects of that. But one of the major factors has been discussed quite quite a lot in the last year or so is T cell exhaustion. So of course, with that in mind, we want to see the systemic immune effects of PTT in the lymphoma model. In this experiment, we compared splenocytes after photothermotherapy on days one, four, and eight to tumor-bearing mice and tumor-naive mice in the red and the blue. We found that PTT did not change the overall composition of the T cell population, so CD4 and CD8 numbers. Um, but we found that on days one and four, there was a quite dramatic reduction of PD1 expression, almost back to the same level of, as a naive mice. Furthermore, we found that several CD4 cell types had reduction in PD1 expression as well. And there was an increase in dendritic cell and macrophage activation as well as numbers. Overall, this suggests that PDT with the oral A system, at least temporarily, creates a more favorable T cell landscape for anti-lymphoma therapy. PTT combined with cell therapy is not a new concept. Uh, we have previously seen that PTT improves adopted T cell therapy before CAR T's was a thing in the B16 F10 melanoma models. More recently, another group in 2019 used a different melanoma model and showed that a CAR T cell therapy was further enhanced by photothermotherapy. So I believe there's definitely some traction here. Obviously, we need to look at it a little bit deeper in our preclinical models that we're doing right now. And, uh, and, and the next step, we're getting uh, both the bispecific and the photothermotherapy into trials. This process, of course, is the more, a little bit more complicated, getting, uh, starting the phase one trial with PTT combined with cellular therapies. In the meantime, the other technology that we're developing is this concept called nanoflame. So what is nanoflame? Well, first we recognize that not all lymphoma patients have easily accessible lymph nodes, despite that we have a probe that can reach almost everywhere in the body. So how do we recreate the same PTT effects without needing to ablate the tumor mass? Well, in this case, we collect cells from a biopsy. Um, we, would, we would mix the cells with the nanoparticles and perform PTT on it to heat and kill the cells to create these damps that we talked about before, ex vivo. We then take the nanoparticle and cell debris mixture and inject it subcutaneously. Last, we will perform PTT on this subcutaneous solution, this, uh, this uh, bubble that we made, as if it was a tumor. Would that really work? First, we tried a tumor challenge model, you see on top, we found that mice treated with one course of nanoflame has caused a significantly slower tumor implantation, suggesting a memory response after the nanoflame. In a treatment model, we implanted a tumor and waited till it was big enough, and then we performed two courses of nanoflame on day zero and three after a tumor was established on the contralateral side. And we found that this treatment had a delay in tumor growth. We are obviously optimizing the system when testing various combination therapies with nanoflame. I think the interesting part about nanoflame once we get it working is that it can be used in other cancer types as, as well, a solid tumor or, or, or obviously blood cancers. Uh, my interest in blood cancers and multiple myeloma would be a very interesting uh, group of patients that we'll, look at it, we'll be looking at as well, because 
myeloma also has FDA-approved CAR T-cell therapies, Abecma and Carvicti, as well as bispecific antibodies that FDA approved, like teclizumab. Um, Those all target BCMA. So that was the first platform that we, we have been developing and really focuses on creating a better T-cell um, landscape to energize the immune system for anti-lymphoma therapy. But that's not all we can do. Nanoimmunology is interesting, but we're gonna change gears and look at another platform that we're also very excited about. Different from the previous platform, this nanoparticle is a drug by itself. So the story goes a little bit further back. Several, several years ago, before I was involved in this platform, uh, Shat Daxon was giving a wonderful talk about his HDL, HDL mimic nanoparticles that deplete cholesterol. And they were testing on various different things, including treating atherosclerosis, which makes sense that it's an HDL mimic. But the idea at the time was that having a gold core, as you can see here, they started with a five nanometer core coated with APOA1, which is kind of the characteristic of the HDL, and backfill it with uh, phospholipids, making it look like from the outside an HDL particle. The idea at the time was that having a gold core of uh, instead of a cholesterol-rich core, as in naive HDLs, these cells no longer take up cholesterol. They're no longer uh, able to and get that cholesterol infusion from the core of the HDLs. These nanoparticles, because they don't change shape like traditional HDLs do, they actually stay on the receptor much longer. The receptor is called scavenger receptor B1 or SRB1. Leo, who was in the audience at the time, mentioned that cholesterol metabolism and lymphoma was a hot topic. And from this one interaction, this is how the collaboration was formed. First, they found that SRB1, which is the receptor for HDLs, are overexpressed in several lymphoma types. Furthermore, this gold lipid nanoparticle platform, or gold LMPs, cause in vitro cytotoxicity of various lymphoma cell types with impressive IC50s, very low IC50s, both in vitro and in xenograft models. Around when I joined this collaboration, the timing was perfect. This paper came out in Nature, suggesting that cholesterol-addicted lymphomas, when starved of cholesterol, had a reduction in a protein called GPX4. And the mechanism of cell death is mediated by ferroptosis. So following that same logic, we found that these gold lipid nanoparticles, which we already know depletes cholesterol and lymphomas, cause reduction in GPX4. We saw that in both Burkitt lymphoma as well as DLBCLs in a reduction in GPX4. John, who did the most of the work in this study, found that there was, there was a collection of oxidative lipids looking at C11 Boda B assays, and there was a rescue of the lymphoma therapy, uh, so there was a rescue of lymphoma cell death from gold LMPs when IR chelators were, in, were incorporated. So the red you see here is just nanoparticles alone, nanoparticles alone and two different lymphoma cell lines. And you, if you add iron chelators like ferrostenin one and DFO, which are the blue and the green bars, you see that um, compared to the red bars, they have a rescued cell death. This together would suggest that the way that these lymphoma cells die was also through ferroptosis. There's a lot of more work that we've been doing in this realm, kind of understanding the process, looking at RNA-seq in different pathways. But we knew that not all of the lymphoma cells were this sensitive to the gold LMPs. One group of cells that we were very interested in is high-grade B-cell lymphomas. We found that high-grade B-cell lymphomas with BCL2 and MIC rearrangements were not as responsive to these gold LMPs. So Maying, who've been working on looking at uh, why that's the case, have found an increase in, ner in the NERV2 pathway, which is an antioxidant response pathway. It may be the reason why these high-grade B-cell lymphomas are more resistant to ferroptosis. And we talked 
talked about this, uh, presented this at, at our last year's ASH annual meeting. And high grade B cell lymphomas were of specific interest to us because they are much higher risk and a much lower overall survival than your traditional TLP cell. Even though high grade B cell lymphomas are a little bit more resistant than traditional DLP CLs, but the IC50 numbers are still quite low, uh, un, under, under 60 nanomolar. But now we know that it works in lymphoma. What about other SRB1 expressing hematologic malignancies? So the original paper in Nature that I mentioned that looked at uh, ferroptosis, as well as our paper in JBC that I just showed you on the last slide, both looked at a cell in Kai U, called U937. U937 is, is seen as an AML cell line despite it coming from a histiocytic lymphoma patient. So there was a little uh, confusion of what this U937 actually is. Is it histiocytic lymphoma or AML cell line? But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's actually a, um, a, a AML cell line. So as a stem cell transplanter, I was obviously interested in seeing how well these gold nanoparticles, these gold LMPs, worked against leukemia cells. Looking at the GEPIA database, we found that high SRB1 expressing leukemia cells, which is in the red, had a worse overall survival compared to uh, lower SRB1 secreting uh, expressing leukemia cells in the blue. So this suggests that SRB1 would be a good target for poor prognostic disease. So we found that not only U937 is sensitive to gold nanoparticle treatments, but two other commonly used leukemia cell lines, MV411, which is a, uh, a myelomonocytic leukemia with a FLA3 mutation, and HEL, both had very low IC50s between essentially one and five nanomolar. In comparison, cytarabine had a between 250 and 500 nanomolar IC50s for those two cell lines. We did a lot of work on this and we, 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 we uh, reported at, at the last year's ASH meeting, but to summarize, we found that these gold LMPs also reduces GPX4 expression in all three cell lines. We found that these gold LMPs do in induce ferroptosis using the same study uh, study options that we saw before with the C11 voda B assay as well as uh, the iron chelator assay. We also found that, especially in the setting of MP411, there was differentiation of the leukemia cells. We saw an increase in CD14 markers on our RNA-seq data. We saw an increase in vitamin D receptor pathways, which is linked to differentiation. And we saw a couple of other marker changes as well that suggest that there's differentiation of these MV411 um, cell lines. But those are just cell lines, right? So we wanna know if this actually works with patients. So after looking at these gold LMPs effects on cell lines, we tested gold LMPs with patient samples. We isolated CD34 positive cells from the peripheral blood of leukemia patients and incubated them with various concentrations of gold LMPs. We found that the gold LMPs induced more cell death measured by flow cytometry. But for a more realistic measurement, we also did colony forming assays with, uh, without CD34 isolation, just from the Buffy coat, with or without treatment of the gold LMPs. And as you can see here, between the PBS and the nanoparticle group, PBS and the nanoparticle group, the last, these, these last two patients, uh, gold LMPs are affected by killing leukemia cells, preventing colony formation. Um, and I wanna give special thanks to our leukemia team for this collaboration project. We're obviously looking at combination therapies with gold LMP as well, specifically with minoclax um, and other chemotherapy agents and combination with gilteridinib for the, for the FLT3 mutated AML cell line. So there's more to come. And we're in, in process of writing a manuscript for this. But that's a lot of science. What are we gonna do with that information? Of course, the next step is to do a clinical trial. So we designed this single arm, single institution dose escalating first in human phase one study. This study was actually reviewed at the ASH Clinical Research Training Institute workshop. They gave a lot of great advice on how we can make this trial a little bit better. 
The patient population in here includes not just lymphoma and leukemia as patients, as we saw the data before, but also other cholesterol addictive malig malignancies that we found that also respond to gold LMP tr treatment. More specifically, clear cell ovarian cancer and clear cell renal cancer. Um, Dr. Daxton and Dr. Matei are driving the ovarian cancer portion with some very promising results. We're still in the process of writing this trial up and um, obtaining IND with the company to move on to clinical trials, hopefully soon. But this talk is about expanding the toolkit in the lymphoma therapy. So um, I'm gonna take, bring this back to lymphomas. This project was interesting because it was started when uh, at an ASH annual conference, Dr. Uh, Steve Rosen came and talked to me about they found a, a drug in their lab called PIC75 that kills CTCLs very well by inhibiting P38 gamma. PIC75 is an extremely hydrophobic drug, as you can see here. And it, and it was difficult to deliver in vivo. So he asked me if we could help with the delivery problem. I said, of course we can. We were working on the gold LMP experiments that we saw before. And during that time, another graduate student in Shad's lab was working on exchanging the gold core with an organic core version of the LMPs, which we can load with hydrophobic drugs. This organic core LMP was similar to the gold core ones in the sense that it also targets SRB1 and looks like HDL from the outside. So the first question is, can we target SRB1? Um, working with the folks at City of Hope, we found that 19 out of 49 CTCL patients had RNA expression of SRB1, an increased RNA expression of SRB1 compared to normal T cells. And the higher the T score, the more likely they would have SRB1 expression, uh, over SRB1 expression. Um, this is a complicated process, but John worked hard in looking at various types of different cores to make these constructs fast and easy in a single pot manner. And um, we found this particular one, this PES4, had the best, uh, the lowest IC50, which is this red line right here. And these IC50s are in the low um, nanomolar range. We're, we're currently working with City of Hope on scaling up this drug. We're working on animal studies and of course toxicity testing so we can further this uh, drug along for clinical trials. So I wanna come back to this slide with the overview of the multiple platforms that we're currently developing. We've talked about two main platforms on the left, which is the photothermal immune activation, and we're hopefully getting our tri that trial up and running later this year. Um, the biomimetic high-density lipoprotein in collaboration and partnership with Zeitlin Biosciences, and hopefully getting that clinical trial up and running soon as well. We also have um, early stage platforms who are working on immune adjuvant nanoparticles, ENs, which can directly kill lymphoma cells while activating the TLR9 pathway. We're working with Dr. Steve Miller in immunology on their nanoparticle platform for the immune, modul immune modulating particles, uh, which they use for immune tolerance for the treatment of graft versus host disease and CAR T toxicities. We are collaborating with an optics lab at University of Illinois Chicago to develop a fast optical way to measure T cell health for CAR T and immunotherapy screening. We also have three concept building projects that are still in the proof of concept phase, but it's important to me that either the early stage or the concept building projects have a pathway to the clinic. So that's kind of always our focus is a pathway to the clinic. So in summary, Northwestern is a leader in innovation in the nanotechnology space. Our lab focuses on the clinical translation of technologies with multiple collaborations and partnerships with industry sponsors. Photothermal immune activation, as we saw in the first part of the talk, can change T cell landscape and improve immunotherapies and cell therapies. The gold LMP pl platform is active against several cholesterol addictive malignancies. We mentioned DLBCLs and ovarian cancer, renal cancers, and leukemias. 
Well, other ones would include CLL, mantle cell lymphoma, Burkitt's lymphoma, and ALCL. Organic core LNPs can carry small molecule inhibitors to SRB1 positive cancers, which doesn't just include CTCLs, but also prostate cancer has an extreme um, has a high increase in SRB1 expression uh, on their surfaces, which uh, Dr. Thaxon's lab in urology is also working on. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Gordon for the wonderful introduction and the years of mentorship and sponsorship. Uh, I want to thank Eva Yang, who's my technician, and John Rink, my partner in crime, both of which have generated most of the data that you see in this talk. I want to thank my collaborators for indulging some of these really crazy and silly ideas. Uh, thanks to my funding sources uh, that I put here on the slide. And of course, last, I want to thank my family, my wife, Lizelle, who didn't really want to be on the slide, so she wasn't on here, um, and my two boys, Liam and Zane. I'll, I'll hopefully end early to give everybody some time back, and thank you for your, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Adam. So I think we have some questions. Uh, should I, I guess I'll just read them, or Sue, if you want to ask, that would be okay, too. Um, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, Adam, that was that was really great. So a couple of questions. So are all cancers considered, quote unquote, cholesterol addicted? Or if I recall from Shad's kind of um, talks earlier on, it, it seemed like they it certainly are quite dependent on cholesterol um, signaling, et cetera. Is that right? Right. So not not all cancers are cholesterol addicted. They, and this is addicted in a way that they rely heavily on cholesterol uptake. Um, so these are these group of cell, these group of cancers are called cholesterol oxytrophic cancers, and meaning they're sensitive to cholesterol depletion. And the the, the list that I mentioned before, ovarian cancer, renal cell, uh, several lymphoma cell lines, uh, the lymphoma types and several leukemia types are cholesterol oxytrophic. Outside of the outside of those, these particles. The, the cholesterol depleting particles don't work very well. But just in follow up to that, Sue, um, we often get the the question uh, when we present this at meetings, when we submit papers, and unfortunately when we submit uh, grants, uh, review <laughs> reviewers say, "Well, you know, why don't you just give uh, statins?" Mm -hmm. um, and so the the key that Adam the key difference that Adam pointed out is uh, this is. Uh, statins would work if it was a, an issue of just cholesterol and cholesterol synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, this is cholesterol uptake and homeostasis in and out of the membrane. So it's a really, it's cholesterol, but it's a different mechanism of cholesterol homeostasis. And which is why we've tried numerous times um, to look at statins and see if we get the same thing and, and we don't. And it was fortuitous in a way that Bermuda's paper uh, in Nature in 2019, just opened our eyes to, we we're wondering what the mechanism of cell death was. We didn't know if it was oxidant. We had ideas that this might be uh, somehow cholesterol. We didn't think to look at uh, glutathione peroxidase 4 until we saw that paper. And basically, uh, you know, the depletion of glutathione peroxidase 4 has become, among people working in this field, a uh, kind of a holy grail. There are inhibitors of that drug, but they're horribly toxic. They basically can't be used clinically. So if we can achieve that um, and get lipid peroxidation uh, through ferroptosis, that's a whole new mechanism of cell death that is applies to a certain cohort of malignancies, which include besides the lymphomas, uh, some lymphomas, not all, uh, ovarian uh, cancer and clear cell renal cancer. It's, their cells are clear because there's a lot of cholesterol in them. Uh -huh. uh, and so, you know, it's a, a certain group of malignancies. And uh, so that's that's where our initial focus is going to be. So so a little bit of a um, tangential question and certainly not really in mm -hmm. the scope, Adam, of your talk, but are these patients, when we check pre and post, are their cholesterol levels different after they're treated with these nanoparticles? So we, we don't know that yet because we haven't done a phase one trial, but we, there has been some uh, papers and one came out of Japan, especially in, in, my, in our world with lymphoma, 
where they found that HDL levels, the lower they are in the peripheral blood, that uh, the, the, the lymphoma cells are more aggressive. And that will kind of mash the idea that these lymphoma cells uptake aggressively HDLs to, to obtain cholesterol. So that's why the peripheral blood levels are lower and that's why they're more aggressive. Um, we, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, um, uh, the only thing, the other thing I wanted to say was that uh, we did test, you know, statins like what Leo was saying with um, with several different of these cholesterol, quote unquote, cholesterol osteotrophic cell lines, uh, especially in, most recently in leukemia. And they did, even though there was also quite quite an interest in using statins to treat leukemia, it, it didn't have a very strong effect on any of the cell lines we did in comparison to the the nanoparticle group that it was dramatically different. And I think a lot of it is just because these particles rely, these, uh, sorry, these leukemias and lymphomas, ovarian cancer, renal cell cancer, re really rely on this uptake of cholesterol instead of synthesis, like Leo was saying. So we've gone quite down a lot of path of this. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do HDL in, in mice and seeing if it goes up or down after treatment because it's, a, it's not very sensitive test there. Uh, but the Thaxon lab have done quite a bit of uh, different types of experiments in that in that sense. And also pertinent to your question, uh, Sue, um, in terms of cholesterol levels, the initial observation, uh, Adam talked about Shad's original talk and talking about this as a cardiovascular drug. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I, I went up to him afterwards was because we had noticed this is one of these uh, bed, bedside to bench to bedside sort of uh, scenarios. But we had noticed, or at least I had noticed in some patients with lymphoma, um, uh, certain types of lymphoma, that people would come in and their cholesterol would be 80 or 70. And when they had active, active disease, and this has been published too, and then you know goes back up to the usual 200 levels when they're in remission. So the question I really was asking is, are there uh, receptors on lymphoma cells which can absorb cholesterol? And uh, that was basically my question. That's what led us to look, we had been working with a bunch of cell, B cell and T cell lymphoma cell lines uh, in the lab, and we just, you know, basically ran all of them, did Westerns on all of them, and found that, uh, in fact, this SRB1 uh, scavenger receptor was present on all the B cell lines we looked at. Interestingly, totally absent in the jerk hat, which is a T cell uh, line. So, um, and we don't know actually from an evolutionary standpoint, or we don't understand why that might be the case, that's another question. But we've always now been able to use the JERCAT line as kind of a control in, in a way. Um, and it's not all T cells, because some of the cutaneous T cell lymphomas that we're working on with Steve do in fact express uh, um, SRB1. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think that's the, there's still a lot of, a lot of questions that, that relate to this. Leo? Well, thank you. It's Marty, I see you on ask. Can I ask, uh, can I ask a quick question? I just have yeah. a comment. You know, your comments about cholesterol and lymphoma are interesting. The observation has been made and published that almost all hematologic malignancies, CML, CLL, hairy cell, lymphoma is associated with active disease is associated with hypocholesterolemia. Those, those malignancies with splenomegaly seem to be associated with hypocholesterolemia. When they're treated, the cholesterols go back to normal. Um, right. right, no, and that's what, exactly, and that's what, that's what kind of led to the very first question uh, uh, for Shad, you know, are there receptors? Why is that the case? Those are the questions, and I'm not sure we answered why that's the case, but at least it led us to look at a bunch of B-cell lymphoma lines and see if they have that uh, that receptor. So, right, absolutely. Uh, and so, yeah, leukemia, not a surprise that they probably, that they express these, uh, uh, mm -hmm. these uh, the SRB1. I think David uh, had a question. David, did you want to ask or I can read it or either way? Uh, sh sure, I can ask. So it, it sounds, if I understood correctly, your, you know, these nanoparticles don't have, the, they have a, a, a gold or you know metal core and thus not cholesterol and so you're kind of disrupting the 
cholesterol uptake. Um, are you also using this same idea that to kind of target other you know, cytotoxic therapies to these same cells that are so avidly trying to uptake cholesterol or right now focused on just kind of disrupting that cholesterol uptake? Yeah, so so it's it's not just disrupting in a way, it's really depleting the cholesterol inside the cells because these particles, when they bind, they prevent natural HDLs to bind too. So we, we kind of saturate all the receptors. So that's why these cells lose the ability to uptake any cholesterol. So it's more than a little bit more than just disrupting just the uptake, the whole downstream signaling that we found, uh, you know, redu changing in GPX, reduction in GPX4 and um, several different pathways leading to ferroptosis suggests that this it's, itself is a drug, which is a little different than when we think about most nanoparticles. As you think about the original nanoparticles that are using to, the level, to de deliver chemotherapy, this nanoparticle itself is a drug and the drug causes um, uh, cholesterol depletion and, and cell death. So it's, it's not like, like Leo was mentioning too, like there's, there's multiple cell lines, multiple cancer types that are cholesterol addicted to uptake specifically. And those are the ones I think this drug would actually be useful for. And also your, your question, David, maybe begs the, I'm thinking begs the question, is there some synergy perhaps, I mean, if that's the implication, it's synergy with some other drug that we, we might have. And there are two findings, one which we didn't get to talk about. One, one is in activated B cell lymphoma, which when there's sort of this tonic a B cell receptor signaling. Margaret Chip had previously shown that B cell receptor signaling, the more B cell receptor signaling, the more cholesterol you have uh, in the cell. So we took advantage of that to see if, if we interrupted B cell receptor signaling with a BTK inhibitor like Britinib, uh, could we get synergy with the nanoparticles in the specifically in the activated B cell lymphomas? The answer is yes, we do in fact see that. Uh, the activated B cell lymphomas aren't as responsive to the nanoparticles as uh, uh, germinal center uh, derived lymphomas. And then the other data that I, I think Marty might be interested in and M didn't have a chance to show, we didn't have time, is the possible synergy we're seeing with um, uh, these nanoparticles with uh, drugs like venetoclax in AML cell lines. It's it's we're still working on exactly you know, the right dose combination to get synergy, but the preliminary data look pretty exciting. And do you want to comment on that, Adam? Or um, then on update? Yeah, so yeah. so we we actually did a couple of ways to look at synergy and uh, we kind of came down to a way of looking at a screening mechanism because we want to see what ratio actually is the best ratio to between, for example, the neural clocks and the nanoparticles. And we found one and then we actually saw some really impressive uh, uh, reduction in the combination with combination therapy in terms of cell kill. Uh, if, it, if, if, uh, if Dr. Talman, you're interested, I'm happy to show you those data. But I think the combination therapy would hopefully move into clinical trials when we finish the first phase one to get really understanding of how this drug works. Very exciting. So that's like systemic drug plus the nanoparticle therapy together. Those yeah, and it, the nanoparticle is also given it intravenously. So... Uh, that would be given intravenously and depend on what combination we do. Like if we did it with venetoclax, for example, or if Brutinib, both are pills, and it would just be an IV infusion plus pills. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the, well, not necessarily the venetoclax, but the, the kinase inhibitors would be pretty specific already. Just thinking about, you know, trying to use the nanoparticles not only to disrupt the cholesterol and, and all the down uh, down regulation that you talked about that happens when it's being taken up, but other, you know, cytotoxic therapies, but I guess that's already pretty specific, the, the, the drugs that you're looking to synergize with. Right. Yeah, and we actually tried to incorporate drugs, and then, um, John has tried a couple of these versions of making this uh, gold LMPs, which this, we consider really a drug, even though we call it nanoparticle, and try to put different drugs on or modifications to it. The, the downside is every time you modify this drug, you will lose efficacies in different ways. So it's better as a separate combination than to be putting all on the same same drug. Yeah, okay. Good. Um, other questions at all? Or? 
Great, Adam. Very nice. And uh, thank you. Appreciate everybody's uh, everybody's interest. Maybe there's hopefully more to come in the next year or so. Yep. Everybody update. Excited. Yep. Yeah. I'm excited to see when our first uh, patient enrolled in a nanoparticle trial is going to be. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Thank you, Elsie. Okay. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.